Shortly after playing the Questmaster demo, I decided to try recreating the final level from Ikari no Yosai 2, which is Jellico's sequel to Fortified Zone for Game Boy. In this video, I will be playing through my adaptation of the level, and frequently comparing and contrasting the rooms between the adaptation and the original. You'll notice I tried to implement various floor detailing throughout. Sometimes I tried to stay faithful to the original level's floor detailing ideas, and sometimes I took some artistic license to tried to do something that I thought looked cool, maybe provided a bit of conveyance. In this room, I decided to equate the spikes to a lava pit, which uh, incidentally provides some fun opportunities for uh, dealing with the enemy in here. The split room design in this level ends up lending itself really well to recreating in Questmaster because Questmaster's triggers only operate within the same room, so it's great for cases where you kill an enemy in one half, which opens the door in the other. Unfortunately, due to that same limitation, I had to simplify this room because the original opens the top left door based on killing an enemy in the room above, which I am incapable of doing in the current demo. The original map features many barriers that you and enemies can shoot over, but you can't move through. I was able to replicate that using push blocks, which can also be altered to not actually be pushable. I added the sign here to draw the player's attention to the pair of torches on the floor on the left side of the room. These correspond directly to the splits visible in the wall in the original game, which happens to love secret doorways. Fortunately, the Questmaster demo supports those too. One thing that actually turns out better in the Questmaster version, in my opinion, is that different types of doors are more easily distinguishable. For example, the door that requires a key at the bottom of this room. Now we enter the first quadrant of the top floor that we will be visiting, which has one of four important ingredients for eventually progressing to the end of this level. What you see in the original version of this room is a switch on the bottom right, which, when destroyed, creates a hole in the top right. I have equated this to bombs and a bombable hole in this version. The chest in the bottom right of this room contains a health refill. I elected to use a pedestal to display the health refill clearly in this version, given that you probably only want to pick it up if you really need the full refill. Each of the quadrants on this floor contains a room with one of these big guys who launches grenades at you and takes quite a bit of firepower to take down. I elected to replace each of these with a multi-enemy fight, and attempted to incrementally increase the difficulty of each of them in the order that the player is most likely to encounter them. I used snakes on this screen as a good approximation of the enemies in the original game which don't actually shoot, they just move towards you. In place of the switch and hole in the original map, I have placed the bombs here, which also serves as progression for other places in the map. One adjustment I needed to make is that in the original game, the big dude actually doesn't lock his own room, he locks the door at the end of the room after. I can't do that in Questmaster right now, so I just had the enemies in each room lock the door at the end of their own room. It may seem like we didn't do a whole lot up here right now, but those bombs will help us for other places in the level, and ultimately towards the end of it for that bombable floor, so just keep that in the back of your mind for now. Here you can see an example of projectiles, in fact, passing through pushable blocks. Even though it looks like that shouldn't work, it actually does. It's not nearly as threatening as those enemies in the original level are, but it still achieves a similar effect. I decided to place a fire bar in this room in place of a grenade turret in the original room. The original room does feature a destructible wall on the top left, although, again, you might be hard-pressed to guess that that's, in fact, what that is. So this is another usage of bombs, and this is unwittingly some progression that I ended up adding to the level because the original gives you a grenade launcher from the beginning of the game. Now this room is the first time that we see conveyors in the original level. Currently, Questmaster doesn't have conveyors, but it is something that they seem to be planning to include. So for the time being, I used weakened floors instead, so you better not stop moving as you go through this room to get to the chest in the bottom right with the key. Now 
now that we have this key, we can go all the way back up to where we saw that first key door of the level before. It's interesting that they decided to lead with by far the longest segue to a key in the entire level. As we open the key door, we find ourselves in the first dark room of the level. Yes, Ikari no Yosai 2 also supports dark rooms. And fortunately, so does Questmaster. In the original game, destroying the only enemy in the room also lights it up, and fortunately we are able to link the killing of enemies to lighting of torches in Questmaster. The original level includes a single turret in this room, which doesn't seem all that threatening, so I elected for a fire bar instead to give us the true Legend of Zelda Link to the Past Ice Palace vibe. This room actually features a right side door in the original game, which I did not reproduce here, specifically because I would not be able to unlock it on the other side from this side. Due to that limitation, I left it out, which doesn't really hamper the gameplay much, other than it means you have to go through a couple of extra rooms again. I suppose I became a bit overly liberal in my use of shell shots here, because if I wanted to be consistent with one of the first rooms in the game, I would have used skeletons here, so oh well, oops. And here we have another use of conveyors in the original level, which I decided to just take artistic license to do something interesting with the room instead. And that artistic license carries into this room where I replaced the conveyors with some grid work over lava. So now we have our second key, but before we go and use that, we are going to take another detour to the second quadrant on the top floor. Once again, just like the previous quadrant, this consists of four rooms, three out of the four involve inner and outer paths, and in this case, the original level has a switch that opens a door, so we will be doing something very similar to that in this version. Just like last time, the inner path on this screen includes a medkit, which, again, I have replaced with a pedestal with three hearts on it so that you can see what you're going to get, so that if you don't need it, you don't necessarily waste it. And as I said, here's our second big dude, which I have, again, replaced with multiple enemies, this time amping things up a bit by including a couple of worms. Unfortunately, you're not able in the demo to trigger a door opening based on killing every enemy of every type in the room. You can only trigger it based on killing all enemies of one type, or one specific enemy. So here we have our first interaction with a switch in Questmaster. There are multiple types of switches. This one is what I used specifically because it activates and you cannot deactivate it again. There is unfortunately a glitch in the next room, where I had previously killed the enemies which had turned on the floor torches. Well, the floor torches are reset, but the enemies are still dead, so the floor torches are staying off. Now you'll notice there's a bombable floor on the right side of this room in the Questmaster version. Believe it or not, that floor on the right side of the room in the original is bombable. That is, hands down, the biggest conveyance gap in the entire original game. In the original game, this is just another health pickup, but given that they dedicated an entire separate room to it, I figured, hey, this seems like it ought to be a big deal. Let's put a big chest in here and put an actual heart container in the chest. So we fall into another dark room, and killing these two enemies is supposed to turn on the lights. That trigger should be simple enough to set up, but for some reason, I was having a heck of a time getting it to actually work, even though the enemies were clearly tied to the torches. 
I ended up turning this room into a pretty major fight and a major item acquisition. You may have noticed early in the map there was a room with a hole blocking the right side door. The reason for that is that door ordinarily opens from the other side. This is that other side, but since I can't trigger doors to open from a separate room, I decided on using the feather for that progression instead. Here's another quick peek into that other room from earlier just to show you what I'm talking about. Here's an example where I tried to mimic the existing floor details where I used the floor plating to approximate the squares seen on the original level. We've got a key door at the bottom right and this will actually be one of the shorter key detours in the level. Here we have another split room with shoot-through barriers. In this case, it doesn't matter much because in Questmaster, once you kill this enemy, it stays dead, which is not true in the original game. And here we have another split room with a switch on one side that unlocks a door on the other. Here we've got another conveyor room, which this time, in addition to the weakened floors, I've decided to spice things up with a couple of vertical moving blade traps. As we use this key, we enter another dark room, which again has a pair of enemies that turn on the lights once you destroy them. Here we've got another room with a turret in the original, which I have replicated using a floor torch that shoots fireballs. Apparently those fireballs might be on a global cycle, I guess, because it was mid-shot when we got here. Way to spoil the surprise. This is another room that in the original game features a door that is opened from the other side. Since I can't do that, in this case I got inventive and put down an array of burners that are opened via the switch on the other side. The idea being that once you come through that door from the other side, you can then enable access in both directions. In the original game, this room unlocks both doors when you destroy the enemy on the left side. I realized that the player doesn't have any projectile weapons right now, so doing that in this case would prove pretty frustrating. So I added another enemy on the right side for some symmetry, and each enemy unlocks its respective door. This room originally has two turrets and some conveyors. Since there's no conveyors in this demo, I took some artistic license. I may have gone a little overboard with this one. Okay, I screwed up on this room a little bit because I based it on my previous playthrough for the most part, which didn't visit this room. So I was going based on a map which didn't show that there were enemies in it. This room includes another case of a door that unlocks both sides based on a switch that's only on this side. Since I can't do that in Questmaster, I use burners again to accomplish a similar effect. I'm also pretty proud of aesthetically what I did on the top of the room. And I attempted to carry that aesthetic into this room. I figured the grid work makes sense, given the hole in the bottom left anyway. This is another case where I replaced a turret with a fire bar, although in this case it honestly doesn't matter, because we're only going to spend a couple of seconds in this room anyway. Here we have a pair of dark rooms with no enemies in them, so I hooked up switches to turn on the floor torches. You can't hit the switch in the first room until you go around through the second. All that accomplished was to get us to the one remaining corner of this room that we hadn't traversed through yet, which in turn gets us to the other side of those burners that we can now turn off and proceed. 
Before we proceed, though, let's dip down here and see where this room connects us to. Now, this room originally has a couple of turrets in it, but when I tried setting up floor torches with fireballs here, 99% of the time they just end up hitting the walls right next to them, which is pretty anticlimactic, so I opted for shell shots instead. Now, this room down here looks pretty interesting, but we're gonna come back here later. We have some unfinished business elsewhere first. So it's time to head on up to the third of the four quadrants on the top floor, which operates very similarly to the second one, with some changes in enemy formations. Once again, we've got a switch that controls a door in the adjacent corner. The cool thing about the original map here, actually, is that you can see the effects of the previous door that we already opened here, which unfortunately isn't really a thing in this version, since we can only control one side of the door. Back in the first quadrant, I had replaced the spikes with a pit with grid work over it since we didn't have a feather yet. Now that we do expect to have the feather by this point in the level, I am free to actually require the player to jump over or something. And once again, I have replaced our fight with one tanky explodey boy with a fight with multiple enemies. This time I opted for skeletons, which honestly are more annoying than they are dangerous. So, with that switch flipped, there is only one quadrant left to go, which we will be approaching shortly. So let's talk about this room a bit. I definitely went out of my way to give the top part of this room a certain sense of finality to it, and uh, we'll find out why in a bit. We're not going to go down that way yet. The bottom part also looks super conspicuous, and we'll find out more about that later as well. We've finally reached the other side of that room with the two shell shots that I talked about before, and now we can clear the path back to the previous area. But we're not actually interested in going back there, we're interested in the staircase that leads up to the final quadrant of the top floor. And lo and behold, we have one more swish to flip, and hmm, is that a staircase at the top left there? For some reason, as opposed to the other three quadrants, this hallway is completely empty. It's as if the enemies phoned in, like, yeah, this is above our pay grade. We saw what happened to those other guys. Okay, now this screenshot is a goof on my part. There is, in fact, one more tanky explodey dude in here. I just somehow didn't manage to take the screenshot before I blew him up. Anyway, accordingly, there is one more big fight in this room, and I've decided to give crabs some proper representation in this level. Okay, that is it. We have hit the final switch in the final quadrant on the top floor. Now all we've got to do is reap our rewards. So, it is time to ascend the Staircase of Finality, and we immediately get to see the results of the four quadrants that we worked through earlier. You might have noticed that each time we hit a switch, it affected a different corner of each room. And that is because we now get to traverse those four corners and fall through the hole that we saw all the way at the beginning. Which leads us to a boss battle. 
Now, the only boss available in this demo is the Lerm, which obviously is a far cry from the I can't believe it's not a sentient RTX 3060 that we see in Ikari no Yosai 2. I decided to put a couple of immobile push blocks in this boss fight room just to make things a little more interesting and also manageable. Once you defeat the Lerm, it drops another heart container for survivability, but why does it do that? Oh, because, hmm, we've got this teleporter. Where does that go? This brings us back to the room with the staircase of finality, but it brings us to the lower portion that was completely detached. Even in the original game, you get warped to this point after beating that boss. Now, I kind of goofed in this room, but I also ran into some technical issues. While you can, in fact, turn on floor torches in response to opening a chest, that doesn't work if the chest closes again, which in this case it does, because we just got the fire rod, which switches places with bombs. I also set up some conveyance here, just in case the player hadn't already noticed that these blocks can be shot through. You need to shoot through these blocks with the fire rod to hit the switch. Now, we're clearly getting towards the end of the level. I mean, we already fought a boss. The original level only contains one measly turret that can usually be shot down before it really gets to do much, so I decided to spice up this room quite a bit, especially given that I've given the player two health expansions and a fire rod. Now this room is precisely why I had placed some conveyance earlier in how you can shoot through blocks with the fire rod, because in this room I expect you to do that. Also, you'll notice there's a boss door here, which explains why there wasn't one before the previous boss, because you can only have one boss door, as far as I know, in each Questmaster level. But Kenny, I hear you say, we already fought a boss, what the hell is this boss door doing here? Well, you can ask the original developers of Ikari no Yosai too that, because, guess what, there's another boss. Now, in Ikari no Yosai 2, this level is the final level of the game, and this second boss of the level is the final boss of the entire game. Therefore, it is pretty spicy in the original, and I have tried to make this fight pretty spicy accordingly. So not only do we have a alarm in the room, we also have fireball, floor torch turret things going on. So this requires uh, a little bit of uh, keeping on your feet and making sure to dodge around so that you're always baiting the floor turrets shot somewhere that you're not going to be. I really tried to make an effort, especially on this subsection of this floor where the final rooms take place, to force the player to capitalize on the two health expansions that they've been given. And you can see my fight gets pretty dicey here, and yes, there's a lot of pressure in this fight, which is also true in the original game, because if you die, then you start the entire level over. But with that boss down, we get a bit of a health refill, and a teleporter that goes... somewhere. Oh, hmm, well, what's this? It seems to be spelling something. Also, if you were wondering why bother to give the player a health refill after you've killed the final enemy in the level, uh, that is entirely so that you're not at critical health and you don't have the game beeping at you the entire time that you're scrolling through this message. That did happen to me in testing once. And the message spells out, see you next mission, which corresponds to the final message you get at the very end of the staff roll in the original game. So that does it. Hope you enjoyed this playthrough and seeing what I was able to whip up, and this is, again, just with the demo of Questmaster. Obviously, I ended up coming up with a lot of potential feature ideas and bug reports out of this, which I have reported to the respective sub-forums on the Steam Discussions board for this game. The developers seem pretty receptive. Fortunately, a bunch of the features I requested are already being planned anyway, so... We'll see what they come up with in the long run. Thanks for watching.